Have you ever been sitting in a conference room with a group of your peers when the boss walks in and says, hey guys, this is the project. This is what we're doing. This is how we're going to do it. And this is when we got to get it done. What do you guys think? I know I've been in that situation. And I know that typically the way that people respond is they go into activation mode. They turn into doers and not thinkers. And it's a matter of having a short time suspense where your brain is, okay, we got this thing. The boss came and said, we got to get it done. And what it does is it turns off our ability to think, to critically think about the situation at hand. And we no longer consider what it means to, we no longer consider the best approach. The approach has been laid out. The boss said it. And would you rather be, who do you want to be in the organization? Do you want to be the person who is stepping up, taking action and accomplishing what the boss want, how the boss wanted it in the time that the boss prescribed? Or do you want to be the person that's throwing a wrench in the gears and says, is that really the best way to do that? Do we really, is that really a priority right now? Yeah. <laughs> who wants, who do you want to be? Some people naturally fall into one category or the other. But the problem is, the more authoritative the leader is, the more difficult this becomes. And we're going to talk about the reasons why. We're going to talk about the symptoms of this and what we call groupthink. And we're going to talk about what the impacts of those are. And finally, we're going to give you the five most impactful ways that you can counteract, that you can disrupt, and that you can completely eliminate or destroy groupthink within your organization. So without further ado, let's jump in. So what is groupthink? According to Google's dictionary, the most formidable on earth, <laughs> and really it's Oxford, right? That's where they always pull from. The groupthink is the practice of thinking or making decisions as a group in a way that discourages creativity or individual responsibility. That's good. I think that's a pretty good summary actually. So we'll take that, especially the discouraging creativity as we discussed when when the boss prescribes, this is how we're going to do it. And especially when they have a couple of really strong and formidable yes people around them, it can be really difficult to interject and to jump in there. And it's not culturally acceptable to generate new ideas. It just doesn't become a part of the process. It's not ensconced within the workflow. With that being the case, let's talk about the symptoms. So the first symptom that you are operating within a group think environment or that your team, your organization is infected with this group think bug is an illusion of invulnerability. So what does this mean? It's this concept that you can't lose. And it might be based on the fact that you've won a bunch. And, it's, and it makes sense. If you have a track record of winning, then you might think that you're invincible. Who's going to stop you? This is something that teams like the Golden State Warriors, for those who followed the NBA, I used to back in the day. I don't really I haven't watched the NBA in years, but I know doing research for this episode, I wanted to find some examples of people and groups that likely thought they were invincible. And so I, I figured a good place to start would be finding some of the best records in sports history. And so the Golden State Warriors in the 2015 to 2016 season actually beat the Chicago Bulls best record ever for a 73 win to nine loss ratio. Now you might think, okay, they only lost nine times out of over 80 games. The Golden State Warriors only lost nine times. That's incredible. That's we dare I say, oh, that's a good year. But what happened? They roll in, they go through the playoffs, they win all of their playoff series. And then when it comes time to go into the finals, they get stopped by Cleveland. Invulnerable? I think not. But what about the NFL? Let's consider what is the what became the best modern franchise in NFL and perhaps sports history, the New England Patriots. Let's go back to what was their best season. Trivia for you guys. What was the best season? <laughs> it was two. The best record is what I mean. So it was actually back in 2007. The 2000, 
2007, it was 2006 to 2007. I think it was 2007 to 2008 season. They won perfect season. They won all of their playoff games. It was looking very Miami Dolphin-ish. Miami Dolphin-ish. Yep. Yeah, that's that'll we'll go with that. I think it was the 76 Dolphins that won out. That's actually a really good example of this and vulnerability. But the Patriots won all of their regular season games. And they were the only team, and they still to this day are the only team who has won with the new slate of games, the 16-game season, which I might that might be different. I think they just updated it, perhaps. I don't remember. I feel like at the end of the season, sorry for those that don't football, (laughs) I don't football that much either, obviously, but I feel like I was watching this season and at the end of it, there was like an extra game that I wasn't anticipating or two. Is there, are there 18 games now? Tell me, let me know. Let me know. Shoot it in the comment section, please. At any rate, they won all 16 games. It was the first and only team to do it in the 16 game season when they expanded it to that many games and they won all of their playoff games and then they played the new york giants who ended up being like the david to their goliath and they got beat old eli manning stepped up and took out tom brady in the super bowl so again invulnerability not necessarily but a counterpoint, like we brought up the Miami Dolphins, they did win, but they all eventually lose. So even, this is really interesting. So apparently the Miami Dolphins, I th- like I said, I think it was the 76 team. They, they went undefeated. They went to the playoffs undefeated and then they won the Super Bowl. The 76 Dolphins were said, this was, this is not, this has been denied by the coach, but I think that there's still lingering theories and, and some residual rumors out there that this might be true that... So they won the Super Bowl, and then the next season, they won their first game. So they had 18-game winning streak. They lost their second game. The Oakland Raiders. Oh, it was 73, not 76. Pardon me, if Wikipedia is right. (laughs) And the rumor was that whenever the Oakland Raiders would lose a game, the players from the team would send a box of champagne to the team that beat them. (laughs) And it was like for like years after that. (laughs) And they would send each other, they would send each other on the team bottles of champagne whenever they would win. It was like this big extravagance. And the coach came out as Shula, I think was his name. He denied that, but I don't know. It may not be true, but I like it at the very least. (laughs) I think that would be pretty cool. So the point is, even if you have an undefeated team, you're never really undefeated because it's an ongoing game. It never ends. And so, yeah, you might have won that season. You might have won the Super Bowl. But sports are a system built on what have you done for me lately. I'm a huge Steelers fan. And no one cares that Ben Roethlisberger won two Super Bowls right now. Chicago was the other example. Yep, counterpoint. Won 72 games. They lost 10. They And they went on to actually win the NBA Finals, unlike the Golden State Warriors. And so you can say, oh, they were invulnerable. No, they did lose 10 games. And also, you go on, what happened the next year? The 1997 Bulls record, 62-20, and 20, so they doubled their losses. <laughs> this is not a great example. <laughs> Because they won <laughs> the championship again next year. Okay. All right. All right. All right, Chicago. What did we do? I, this is like when I watched basketball. I was from Omaha, Nebraska. We don't have sports for anything. So we just adopted the teams that were relatively close to us. And Chicago is one of the places that, that was closest to us. And uh, so I, and it was Michael Jordan. What are you going to do? 98 Bulls record. Yeah. Yep. 62 and 20. They beat the Jazz in the NBA Finals. What about 98, 99? So that's when Jordan left. (laughs) 99. The 99 records, they were 13 and 37. Chicago Bulls season was the franchise's 33rd season. And yeah, oof, oof, did not qualify for playoffs. (laughs) See, to that point, it never ends. Invulnerable. Did the coach and staff think that the, the people who run the organization, the owners and the managers, did they think that they were invulnerable? They were on top of the mountain forever. Only to turn around and be like, oh, no, that doesn't work. (laughs) That didn't work out so well, did it? So what's next? The next symptom of groupthink is self-righteousness. So it's this idea that we deserve to win. It's, It's the right thing. Like, we are the good guys. 
they everyone else are the bad guys so what we do inherently by the fact that we do it means that it's right and it means that we should win you see this a lot in the i was gonna say it's more of a historical thing at this point and obviously religions inherently have faith that they believe that they are correct but it's not like the crusades and then but what so what we see more now is philosophy or religions like seriousness placed into politics at least in the west or at least in the united states so we're seeing high levels of consternation and this is actually gonna end up being a more of a political show than we've ever done here before which is fun and interesting but to dive a little bit back into history we had mentioned crusades briefly so we could go into the crusades and talk about how the muslims and the christians were fighting over holy cities like jerusalem and they both have religious claims to these holy and so there's a sense of self-righteousness to the point when people are willing to kill and be killed for them that's pretty self-righteous that's taking it pretty seriously what is more entertaining to me at this point is that there was a thing called the children's crusades so the children's crusades were led by a 12 year old boy named stephen stephen it doesn't matter <laughs> so he apparently had a vision a divine vision from god who knows maybe he ate some funky wheat had a little bit of mold on it maybe had a little experience and nibbled on some mushrooms <laughs> had himself a great time and then felt compelled to communicate with his friends about this vision that he saw. And so he took this vision and apparently his skill of influence and impression and being able to motivate and lead people. And he gathered up quite a little following of his friends, right? Fellow kids, also women, also the elderly. Now, a lot of this is this very mentioned very briefly in the annals of history and the actual books and, and the actual writings of the people back in the age of the crusades and those were it was like, and this mind you this was like 1000 like not 1000 years ago i guess technically that would be about right <laughs> but it was in like the year 1000 to 1290 something i don't know i don't know but what was interesting was that this kid, this Stephen, convinced these people to follow him. And they went on this long journey for, to Paris to, to convince the Pope to authorize and bless off and endorse this vision that, that Stephen had. All of these people are these women and these elderly people are there and they're just, they're dehydrated and they're looking for food and they've been traveling for a very long time. And he comes out and he's like, all right, Pope didn't say it was good, but we're going anyway. And so there's not really a whole lot of evidence in the conclusion of this story and how it played out, but it's marked by most historians as a complete and utter disaster. And it could only be either at that point, there's a huge disintegration of the group. They're like, all right, kid. And then the group completely falls apart. That would be the best case scenario. Next case scenario is that they're going and they start to starve and die on the path to Jerusalem from Paris. <laughs> Wow, how would you even get there? You gotta go across the whole Italy, the whole boot. As the crow flies, God, this is so cool. Look at this, freemaptools.com. How far is it? Distance as the crow flies. What a great expression. 3,329 miles. <laughs> now given, theoretically, they would have gotten on a boat to gain the seas, theoretically, by land transport. This is modern day, by the way. Who knows what it would have been then? 4,500, and let's round up and say, round down <laughs> for Stephen's sake, and say 4,507 miles. Impressive. It's a, That would be a very impressive journey. And given, like I said, that's given today's road systems and all of that. The distance was no. I think that was the correct distance. It was, but that is, that's self-righteousness. Right? And that's a charismatic, authoritarian, word of God down to the soul, out from him to the people situation that led to uh, unhappy outcomes. So let's, we're going to, we got to avoid the Stevens. We got to keep our eyes out. So what's next? The next part is rationalizations or justifications. 
in history, we can look back at the slaveholding states in the United States and say, look at the justifications they made for slavery. And it was, they're not, and this is the thing, the justifications and rationalizations, when they're done well, they're accurate, but it doesn't mean that they're right. There's a difference between right and accurate. Facts don't necessarily tell the truth. So if we look at slavery, the South could say we're an economic powerhouse and that because of slavery, we sell so much stuff. We sell all of this cotton and all of these other products. Uh, it was indigo and uh, tobacco and all this huge exporter. All of this exporting brings in these materials and money from overseas and and really boosts america up imagine how they would have made money without that this is the south's position we don't have the people to do the work it's not like they had like the giant machines that we have now <laughs> i just spoke at a grain elevator and processing society M meeting not meeting it was like a symposium like an annual conference Beautiful Kansas City Convention Center, gorgeous. But it's, I'm really mad at myself because if they're listening, if you guys are out there and you're listening, I'm sorry because after attending, I should absolutely have like the correct terminology down. It was an incredible event, but the key here, the bottom line, the justifications are going to make sense and they're going to be like believable. You're going to be able to buy it. It's going to have some truth in there when they're good. And so it can make it hard. This isn't say this is easy. A lot of times combating group think identifying it can be difficult. Another, so if we look more modern in modern times, like modern politics, like I promised you, <laughs> we were gonna talk about, we can look at the left or the Democrats or mandate for electric vehicles, like in California. The justification is that we need to save the environment and global warming. And it's, a, it's an emergency that has to be handled right now. This is a way to get us off of fossil fuels. There you go. Now, don't mind <laughs> that the slave labor that's going into place with no protective equipment, no safety regulations, and child labor that is going into the extraction of the minerals and materials to put together the batteries for this. So the moral standpoint falls in and collapses in and on, in on itself. So it definitely takes out the moral perspective, but if saving the environment, maybe it's justified. I, this goes back to, it sounds very much like the slavery justification where it's okay, it's not economics, but it's the world climate. And so is it, does it justify child slave labor to save the environment. Some people might argue, yeah, they might justify slave labor. Like, yeah, that is what it is. We gotta do what we gotta do. I don't know, so, <laughs> gotta save the planet. So some kids gotta get locked up, and thrown into a mine. I'm sure that's not actually, that's very straw man-ish. <laughs> it's very weak argument that I don't think a lot of people make. I just don't think a lot of people think about it. They just think about, I could buy a car that produces toxic fumes for the environment when I drive it, or I could buy a vehicle that doesn't. And so even if we take that out, even if we allow ignorance to be an excuse in this case, let's consider that. We'll think about the how we produce electricity. A lot of it's by burning coal. <laughs> and so if we're burning coal to make electricity for the car that you're plugging into and think about all of the process to take these converted slave, child slave labor produced minerals and to convert it into a usable in a usable form that goes into the batteries. It's a lot of manufacturing, a lot of factory work, using a lot of electricity and supported by a lot of dirty fuel. So how much dirty energy is being used to produce these batteries that we don't even have a way to dispose of and then go in our landfills and then ruin the earth forever or for long enough to be considered forever in our case, in our short lifespan. So it's right, there's justifications, rationalizations. Now, I don't want to get you twisted. The right's not safe here either. <laughs> so justification for global intervention. Interestingly, for the first time in my life and for the lives of the people before me, at least a generation, 
the left has decided to join on this train too and say we should we need to intervene in wars ukrainian flags on all the social media bios but at any rate this is definitely a right thing so let's not get it twisted the conservatives republicans think if we don't fight them over there we'll have to fight them over here right it's a justification that they're making based on 9-11 like we were fighting them over there before we fought a war in Iraq and then we used 9-11 as a justification weapons of mass destruction somehow linked into theirs ask yourself how do the weapons of mass destruction link in with the terror attack from 9-11 and we're, it just doesn't just not a lot that makes sense about that given where the people were from at any rate it's not what we're here to get into so Let's look at the next step here. The next indication, the next symptom that your group is suffering from, groupthink, is stereotyping. So exam modern examples of stereotyping. Democrat, of a Republican to a Democrat. Republican says, Democrats don't know how money works. They don't even care. They just see the government as a print printing money creation machine that is there to fulfill their needs fulfill their desires which is to give handouts to everyone that everyone in their voting block and to convince more people to join their voting block by giving them money basically political bribing and saying we'll give you these entitlements and we'll just cut checks we're getting to the point where like oh yeah universal basic income just cut checks for everyone and look how effective that is what happened over COVID 19 and the pandemic so this would be the stereotyped, again, like I was, like you had heard just briefly a little bit ago, a straw man version of the argument. That's what the stereotype, the point that we're getting at here with groupthink is that views of the outside, we stereotype, we straw man, and we dismiss. And so Democrats would say Republicans don't stand for anything other than their own pocketbook. It's, they're all about the money. They don't care about anybody else. They don't care about the environment. And they are racist and they're misogynistic and they're homophobic. And they just want to return to their 1950s white male dominance over the world. And so these are the stereotypings that we'll see in modern day. They extend, for those that follow politics, but it exists in many othering. It's many othering straw man creating the worst version of, and the least true or accurate version of an outside group or the others. Yeah, I th made me think about Waterboy when he's, Adam Sandler's character is having like the conniption on the field about Gatorade and water. <laughs> like water sucks. It really sucks. It was, it was good. It was really good. But yeah, it's, um, it's othering. So that was just pretty fun. So the next indication that your organization is in, is susceptible or is succumbing to group think is a pressure to conform. So, so pressure to conform is, it's almost a, passive thing it's not something you feel actively it's there is a there's a sense among the group that this is these are the standards and norms it's the culture almost it's just an unhealthy a toxic culture where it's the expect the expectation is to conform to the will and the why how and what of the leaders and like i said when the leader has a couple of really strong yes people around them that can really help insulate them that actually goes into this concept of mind guards when we think about this would be the idea for those that are familiar with intelligence and what happened around 9 11 the military intelligence not military intelligence but just intelligence agency stove piping and that is where so i even experienced this on a small scale but in 9 11 I, there was a there was enough communication in the various intelligence collection parts of the community, the IC community, or I guess the IC is the intelligence community, right? So an intelligence collection community that, that if they would have been communicating with each other, they would have seen, oh yeah, there's an attack and it's definitely going to happen. But because they all had pieces and they were communicating with each other that no one got to see the full picture. This is a really rudimentary <laughs> understanding of what happened, but it is essentially one of the things that took place is that there was a there was a lack of communication and stovepiping. And so I, I, on a personal level, when I was in the army, we saw this in intelligence, there is a 
for those that are aspiring to do to get to the political ranks when you get to full bird colonel and above you enter into this political realm right and so it's less about war fighting and being like tactically sound and engaged with your people and it's more about how do you politic some people know that from jump street and they want to operate that way and they take actions to put themselves in the best position from very early on and so we would see this you'd see people even when we're doing briefs just low risk low reward even a relatively high reward for the level of risk kind of briefings updates that we would give to our full bird commander and where there would be sub units subordinate to our intelligence cell so we were like brigade the commander of a brigade is a full bird colonel right and then we'd have battalions underneath of us and the brigade has their intelligence section there's also a military intelligence company and then there's each battalion, five, six, seven of them, each has their own intelligence section as well. Sometimes those battalions <laughs> have a guy or a gal that was very career oriented, <laughs> we shall say. And they would hold on to information and they wouldn't share it with the brigade. They wouldn't share it with the other battalions. And it wasn't like life or death. We weren't deployed. It was... We were basically doing kind of rehearsals and making sure that the commander was spun up on the things that were happening in the world. But rather than communicating some findings that they would have with their adjacent units and their superior units, they would hold on to it so that way they could be the star of the show. And so that's that is that's kind of like that stove piping. But when you look at mind guards, right, that's that's a little bit different. So a mind guard is think about Putin and what's how what happened in Ukraine. Do you think Putin had the full breadth and depth of information, the full accuracy understanding of the strength of his military force and what he was going to encounter, like the strength of the Ukrainian defense upon their entry, the strength of their force? Or do you think that they, his people talked up the strength of the Russian, their armed forces a little bit and talked down the effectiveness of the Ukrainians? Now... That's just from Jump Street. From then, <laughs> I don't know if they anticipated, I don't know if it would have been reasonable for them to anticipate that we would drop like 100 bill, the war fighting effort. But I think that they imagined that they were going to go in there, they were going to stomp so hard that there wasn't going to be time really for anybody to respond in an enduring fashion the way that's happening now. They were going to go in, we were all going to hem and haw and hand ring and but it wouldn't matter because stomp 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 done we took this back all right it's all good you guys can be mad about it but it's done so i think that was the idea and that's not exactly what happened so mind guarding can be a reason that that took place because his people were protecting him from the accurate quote unquote protecting him from the accuracy of the information because it contradicted his point of view his vision of like their stance and their ability their strength so going on to the last piece of groupthink is illusions of unanimity, right? So very simply, this is the idea that like everyone must agree. And so everyone does agree. And so when, again, we go back to that initial situation, that scenario that we talked about right at the top of the show, you're sitting in that conference room. You have all your peers around you. You're getting ready for the boss to come in to talk about this new project that's happening. They come in, he, she comes in, and they lay down, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And this is when we're going to do it by. What are your thoughts? Everyone inherently agrees by the nature of going to task focus. Of saying, okay, I'm gonna, we can do this over here from my team and from that team. They can, the, somebody else jumps up and says, oh, yeah, we can handle the marketing. And then these people say, yep, we know the people in distribution. We can make this happen. And so we're... we're unanimously agreeing to the premise without consideration of the premise or we're avoiding consideration or we've considered it and we're like okay we're just silence is compliance so it's self-censorship right it's something that we see all the time it's something that i've done what i had to do during covid when it came to the youtube channel when it came to producing shows and content i had to think about saying the word pandemic saying the word covid 19 if i wanted to get 
shows out to the most number of people saying those words weren't the way to go so it was self-censoring but it wasn't even a conscious sometimes it was in the beginning it was conscious and now it's funny because as i was doing it with the shark i wrote it down and like when i was doing the prep and the research i thought oh man i wonder if that's still a thing i don't know it doesn't seem like it i don't it's i don't care <laughs> i don't care anymore and so i said it a lot <laughs> on this show but it's okay it's okay you guys will get it but really the idea that what's really happening behind that is that everyone it's not that everyone agrees it's that everyone agrees that they shouldn't disagree that is the feeling that is like the epitome of all that is groupthink is that rolled up into that statement right there all right so let's look at what how do we combat groupthink what are and like i said if we think about these in the sense of are they present are these happening or is something else happening and if these aren't taking place in some way shape or form maybe we look at some of those symptoms of groupthink and we start to see well, that does look like it might be present and then we can move from there but and if, if those symptoms are present you can start doing these especially if you're in a position of leadership you can do this within your team and you can op start to operate like that and you can start to take the actions you can even as a subordinate in these positions as you feel comfortable with your level with your leadership but this is really a lot for the leaders out there to be considering and those aspiring leaders once you get into these positions of leadership how do you want to do this so let's get into it the five most effective ways to combat disrupt and destroy groupthink number one patience young grasshopper <laughs> Yes. So very frequently as leaders, when we get up in front of people, we want to speak. We want to clearly communicate. That's what we're told. You have to clearly communicate with your team what the intent is. Great. Start with the intent, but not necessarily the execution, right? Focus on acquiring don't share so number one don't share your position right away enact patience i think about this with with some podcasts some group-based podcasts if you think about the pbd podcast whether you like his politics or not i like that he has on people from different different perspectives i find myself disagreeing with with him and his crew of homies all just other things that i do agree with. it's really neither here nor there but really what's cool about it is that he will put out they'll talk about an article he'll bring up an article and he'll say what do you think what do you think before he gives his opinion it's if he ever has a super strong opinion about something he will actively go to the other people on his team first and they are all subordinate to him it's all very clear throughout the show sometimes in somewhat disgusting ways that they are subordinate to him not from his actions but from their actions to him there's a lot of butt kissery sometimes and it's weird it's really weird at any rate but that's a really cool thing that he does right is that he wants to hold back his opinion in many cases so that it doesn't sully the waters and so that he can get genuine feedback in the, what people are thinking it's hard to get genuine feedback from people when you've like incept leonardo dicaprio inception planted your idea in their head now they're okay i'm gonna run my idea through the filter of your idea right in a kind of self-censoring fashion number two propose possible arguments yourself so if you are if you bring up an idea you should have two or three counter arguments to your own thought process or even just questions voice the other side's opinions or think about what somebody would say who doesn't agree like how can you get create a devil's advocate and sometimes that's hard to do for yourself and that's why you want your team to do that and so if you're trying to set up if you're trying to build this culture from the ground up look at assigning a devil's advocate Pick somebody on the team. Pick somebody who is really good at, and like in the project that you're working on. That's someone that's got a lot of experience. They got strong opinions. They're not they're not really hesitant to share them and you assign them like, hey, listen, I want you to push me. I want you to tell me where I'm wrong live in the meeting on the call when we're doing this in real time. I don't want to know it now. 
I just want you to be the person I'm assigning you. And then that way it breaks the seal and it accepts the norm. One of the, one of the key things in here that goes in to multiple steps of this, but a lot of this is about, actually, we'll just move on. We'll get to that. So assign a devil's advocate, right? So number one, patience, ask for other people's thoughts before you give your own and then assign a devil's advocate. No, the next is ask questions, right? And so you ask questions. So you're assigning a devil's advocate, right? That's different. Someone to combat your ideas with different ideas or to point out why they're wrong, but then bring somebody else in, assign a PI, right? Your next assignment, you can grab somebody else in the group, say, you're my private investigator. I need you to, to inter or my, you're my interrogator. I need you to interrogate me as I'm proposing these ideas. Right? If there's not a lot of feedback from them, like, all right, give me your ideas. And, stuff's happening and then when you do finally give your opinion at the end you want even then you want somebody there interrogating you like okay what about this did you think about that someone that's again that has experience in the field that can generate good questions and you don't want them ahead of time all right you're not planning out this isn't like a play you're not creating something fake you're ensuring that you're showing that this is the culture of the organization this is the culture of the group and so those things alone, right? That's not enough. You can't have a devil's advocate challenging you and you can't have a interrogator interrogating you unless you know how you're going to respond, which is the benefit of doing this on the front end. Again, it's not a play, <laughs> it's not a skit. You need to embody the version of leadership that you want to be and that you want to see in your people and to develop the type of norms. You want to exhibit the type of behavior that you want your team to exhibit, that you want to establish the culture around this. So you need to plan how you're going to respond. If it's not natural for you, if you don't like being challenged, <laughs> who does? But you need to plan it out. Like, okay, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to point out that's a good idea. I'm going to have a structure. I'm going to structure to this. I'm going to tell them, I'm going to thank them. Hey, you know what? That's a really good question. Thank you for asking. Number one, boom. That already sets the tone that, oh, that's acceptable. Like that person just challenged the boss and he thanked him. And now he said it was a good question. And now he's actually responding and they're engaging in this flow. It sets the norm. You're creating the culture. Another step you can do, things are getting a little bit dicey and you're not sure that you're actually cutting through and that there there might be some residual group things, some people might be self-censoring. Depending on the size of the group, and depending on the situation, you can break it down into smaller groups, smaller breakout groups. And it doesn't have to be live. It just doesn't have to be like this all day event. It can be if it needs to be, but this could be like, hey, you know what? You three and you three, you guys all get together talk about this over the next week set some times up for yourself and let's get back together and that actually goes back into we want to reunite it's like a key step of this you can't just do breakout groups and then like all right cool that was fun <laughs> now you guys have, have talked it out you need to bring everyone back together so you can discuss the differences like what came of it what were the conclusions and you, you can assign a spokesperson or you could just free flow, but you come back together and you can have that conversation. And again, you're asking questions. You're, you've got devil's advocates. And as the leader, you're seeking information before you're looking to give it. Okay. So that was all five. Check it out. Well done. But what I wanted to share with you guys are a couple of extra bonuses, a couple of bonus lessons here. So to go a little bit further, what you can do. So if you want to bring in some other people from the organization, or even if you have connections of people outside of the organization, you can invite them, invite experts and other associates and other departments into service counterbalancing roles. And you can even assign them as the PIs and the advocates. So that way it's people that are outside of the group that are coming in and challenging too. And then, so that's the bonus number one. <laughs> bonus number two is uh, tack on a second chance or alibi right so like you can do the breakout groups and you come back together but it doesn't have to be you don't have to have a breakout group to to have a come back together moment so you can have this meeting you can go through all of the kind of proper anti anti group think pr procedures of exactly all of the steps we just talked about 
And then later, you bring people back together. Hey, listen, you guys had some time to think about this. Before we take this next big step, I wanted to get genuine feedback. And you can let them know, letting them know on the front end, like, hey, listen, at the end of this meeting, we're gonna come back together. So I want you guys to, to mull it over. We covered a lot of ground. So please gather your thoughts and we're gonna come back together on this day. If there's anything that you can think of between now and then, I want you to bring it to that meeting. And that way you're encouraging, right? Still more feedback and allowing people time to process because people process information in different times, ways, fashion. Some people are gonna have a hard time processing information in a meeting live with a group of people you're gonna have, I just had an amazing conversation with Dr. Daniel Franz, who is like a logo therapist, v Dr. Victor Frankel, logo therapy being assigning the importance of your search for meaning into therapy. I think that's extremely powerful. I actually think that all there, I don't know if all is a dangerous word. I think that very rarely a person that wouldn't benefit from some self-examination around your meaning and your purpose and how to incorporate that into a more functional, more productive life. So Dr. Dan's great about that, but he, uh, yeah, we talked about that. What I... Yeah. So we talked about that on the show and it was, that was really good. It was a really powerful conversation. Something you guys should definitely go check out. And finally, anonymity where appropriate. So sometimes during creative, especially during the creative portions, let's think about brainstorming, for example. So for brainstorming, sometimes having your name assigned to ideas might limit what you're willing to put on the board. Go ahead, put that up. I don't want them to like think I'm crazy. <laughs> I, I, but who knows and that crazy idea that you're self-censoring because your fear of judgment and reprisal and potential reprisal and violations of conformity are, are they're inhibiting you from, from putting that out there and inhibiting the group from being able to see it and judge it. So using technology in a way for where you can anonymize information that goes into maybe a virtual brainstorming board, board versus like a hard one. But if you want to do it in person, you can do like notes. You can write them on post-it notes, crumple them up, throw them into a jar, and then somebody's pulling them out or whatever, and then writing them up on the board. And just a way to anonymize that to encourage creativity to encourage anti-group think i hope you guys enjoyed by all means check out the interview with dr dan or not interview but the conversation with dr dan it was a lot of fun really cool and i think you'll really enjoy it and the next com the next time we do this is going to be same time next week we're going to be talking about effective ways to brainstorm that seems like a really good way to go from here to the next step so let's talk about brainstorming next week on Real Resilience. See you guys then.